The story of Britain's King George VI and his Queen Elizabeth is a story of goodness growing to greatness and a story that proves the old saying, behind every great man is a great woman. In a short reign, just 14 years, George and Elizabeth created an ideal of the British royal family, writing a script, devising a format that dominated the idea of what the monarchy should be, a model example of family life lived by a king and queen sharing the hopes and wants of decent, ordinary people. Marriage and reign are inseparable. The tale lies decades in the past, yet the legacy of George and Elizabeth lives on in the way that their eldest daughter rules as Elizabeth II. The older Queen Elizabeth would live on for 50 years as the Queen Mother, a central character in the royal story. If today the future of the monarchy is doubted, it's because the scenario imagined by the old king and queen is failing. What they built was strong enough to survive, but not flexible enough to change. In truth, George and Elizabeth did not invent the royal family as an ideal family. Rather, they perfected the perfect royal family. George VI's great-grandparents, Queen Victoria and her husband, Prince Albert, were the very first to be sold to the British people as ordinary. Before Victoria, kings and queens might have been admired, respected and glorified. But the idea that they were an ideal of family life would not have been understood, even thought ludicrous. Even then, it was royal propaganda. Victoria and Albert had difficult times with their children, especially the eldest, who would become King Edward VII. Behind his public image, Edward VII, George VI's grandfather, was an immoral man, someone today we would call a sex addict. George VI's father, George V, while faithful to his wife, Queen Mary, was a cruel and distant parent, in modern terms, emotionally abusive. Early images of the boy who would become George VI shows him, his brothers and sister, drilled like soldiers by their father. Projecting the image of a man surrounded by children and grandchildren behind palace doors, George V was a pitiless bully, once saying, my father was frightened of his mother, I was frightened of my father, and I am damn well going to make sure that my children are frightened of me. There were physical beatings, but mainly ruthless criticism and fault-finding. The royal children could do nothing right. George V feared his children would be surrounded with sycophancy and was determined to compensate for such by cutting them down to size. The development of his children as emotionally stable and independent was disrupted by this lack of unconditional love, complicated further by the king's contradictory notion that despite their lack of worth, his children were not to behave like other children. A conflicting notion was ingrained into his children and carried into adulthood. They never knew exactly where they stood. But with King George VI and his Queen Elizabeth, the happy family you saw was what you really got. George and Elizabeth's story perhaps proves such a thing as destiny. George VI was born Prince Albert, Bertie to his family, the second son of George V and Queen Mary. When Prince Albert was born, few imagined he would be king. Albert's eldest brother, Edward, Prince of Wales, David to the family, was the first in line for the throne. While Edward had his own problems with his father, he had charm, confidence and wit. He was idolized by the press and public, nicknaming him Prince Charming. 
Bertie got used to being second in everything, just a spare. He was nervous, highly strung, and crucified by shyness. A natural left-hander, forced to be right-handed. He had a powerful stammer, and tormented by nervous twitches and uncontrollable rages. I'm sure that we are all happy to feel that the generosity of His Majesty. Struggling with his speech, Albert was viciously taunted by George V. The public speeches the stammering prince had to make were a personal hell. Albert was, however, a natural athlete, a superb shot, and good enough tennis player to play at Wimbledon. He joined and loved the British Navy, serving in the Battle of Jutland when the fleets of Germany and Britain clashed in 1915. Those who really knew Bertie saw past the shyness and stammering, finding a man of real courage. King George V grudgingly said of his second son, Bertie has more guts than the rest of them put together. After the First World War, the King created Albert, the Duke of York. Prince Albert married Lady Elizabeth Bowes Lyon on the 26th of April 1923. When they married, no one ever expected they would become King and Queen. Elizabeth Bowes Lyon was the daughter of a Scottish aristocrat, the Earl of Strathmore. Born on the 4th of August 1900, Elizabeth enjoyed a childhood unlike her husband's, a time of happiness, fun, and a deep sense of security. Elizabeth's mother loved life and encouraged her children's education in culture and the arts. Lady Elizabeth's father was quiet, dignified, and conscientious about his position, believing wealth and privilege brought duty and responsibility. While Elizabeth's parents were devoutly religious, they were not joyless Puritans. Regular evening prayers were followed by cocktails before dinner. Elizabeth's childhood home, Glam's Castle in Scotland, was a nursing home for the wounded during the Great War, housing 1,500 soldiers. Elizabeth was just 14. Lady Elizabeth was not fashionable or a great beauty, yet men adored her. She was a petite, dark-haired, blue-eyed debutante, elegant, with a beautiful smile. She was funny, confident, with a powerful personality, an incredible flirt, yet proper at all times. She could have married whomever she liked. The love story began in early 1920. In classic romantic style, Prince Albert fell head over heels in love with Elizabeth across a crowded London ballroom. <laughs> 